I've got something quite interesting to uh, show you here. Um, it's an emergency light, an LED emergency light, and at the moment it's in um, charging mode, and if I unplug it, the green light changes to the white, and it puts out about one watt of light. It's quite bright, it's not too bad, it's quite a smart little unit. And at the moment it's running completely off this battery. So uh, let's um, take a look inside it. So everything just unplugs like this. And it is designed uh, to fit all of it through a 35mm hole in the ceiling so that you can basically just shove the battery pack up, shove the uh, controller up and then finally shove this into position and then it just latches with a spring clip in place. So let's take a look at the LED head first. Just sit that down there because it's been dragged off to the flex. So this unscrews like so many of these um, aluminium LED housings do and it reveals what looks like a standard 3 watt LED, but it's got four pins, two on either side. Two of them are common at one side, and at the other side um, it's got two pins. And it's interesting because this has a white chip in it, that's the one watt white chip, plus it's also got the green indicator chip in the same package and under the same layer of phosphor, so I'm guessing it may be quite a cold green chip and the phosphor just, although the phosphors really intend to be activated by blue light, it probably gets partially activated by the green light and gives off a slight sort of red element to the colour as well and that's why it's that apple green colour. And the machining of this is nice because it's got a separate um, recess for the LED in here. That The LED isn't stuck in, I don't think. Is it stuck in? Hold on, I'll just test that. No, it's got, it's got a fairly thick and stodgy um, silicon goo there, but it is just uh, the wet type silicon goo. And when it's in that position, it, um, it holds absolutely dead centre. So that when this is screwed on, um, it clamps it, it down completely via the pressure applied in the centre. Um, and it's, it's quite a nice little light, I have to say. It's an unusual LED though, it absolutely kind of rules out changing it. Um, that does put good pressure as well on that, that's holding it in place nicely. Uh, it does rule out changing it because it's not a standard LED. Um, I suppose that technically speaking, no you couldn't really do anything, you couldn't actually do, all you could do is maybe add a separate LED externally, but having said that, probably by the time this fails you, you'd have to change a lot of the other bits, like the you're supposed to change the battery pack every three years I think, replace battery every three years. Yeah. So that's quite a nice start, the the LED arrangement. Uh, and it does have just one common wire, I think it's the common black, and then it switches the red and yellow. Yeah, I think so, but it was quite odd in the circuitry. So the battery pack uh, is held together by clips. That when you push these clips in, the end cap can come off. And it's got three wires going into it, including an earth wire, And inside, the earth is connection is made by this springy metal uh, clip here. And then it's just a stack of fairly, I, I was going to say standard nickel, uh, are they nickel cadmium or nickel metal hydrogen? I guess these might be nickel cadmium, but then again, cadmium is supposed to be sort of banned from manufacture, so they're probably nickel metal hydride. And they're what I'd call an industrial size. They're not. Um, a, a, they're not something like a double A or a C. It's somewhere just below a, a C type cell. I think it just seems a wee bit narrower than than a normal C cell would be. So that's quite uh, interesting. The main unit. What's the best way to take this off here? Uh, if I unclip this, this is the mains inlet end. Is that going to work? Yes, that should kind of work. Um, am I going to have to disconnect this complete to take it out? I am. Oh well. This is the mains inlet end, and um, it's got an earth wire here that goes onto this screw, which is just a, a nut and bolt. 
And in a way, that also, I mean, they could have used the spring arrangement, but this probably provides a better connection given this is the main high voltage bit, the main 240 volt bit. And um, that also um, <coughs> means that when they, if someone does an electrical test on it, they get a good electrical connection onto that point. So I'm going to pull this out from the other end now. So again, the clips get pushed in. And this slides out, and it's got a um, channel in here in the extrusion for that to hold the circuit board in place. And the circuit board has notable channels, very clear channels down the side to avoid um, electrical connections. I'm just going to short this out because uh, it's the mains capacitor inlet. That's that. That's all right. So I've already done some tests on this. You've got the mains come in, goes straight through a bridge rack far. Um, the earth. Uh, goes to this connection, this the flying earth connection, but it also goes along to the end where it goes straight out on the, this wire to the battery pack just to uh, earth the battery's housing. And in a way I thought, well, it's not really needed because it is an isolated supply, but unfortunately they see, they've got good isolation between the primary and secondary of the transformer here, but as soon as the, it comes to the opto-isolation, then they've kind of screwed that up and it's like sub-millimeter isolation, sort of China style. So I think they've just maybe over-skimped with the, um, with the sort of uh, track, the component placements there. They've really kind of defeated the isolation in that aspect. But it's, you know, it's good enough. You, you're not really going to be handling the output of this. Or oh, we'll see, though we'll see. I wouldn't trust something like this. If the, this is effectively connected to the secondary, so the clearance inside is such that you get so much metal work, uh, and this isn't earth that you know. Mm, yeah, but certainly it's still better than the Chinese stuff. But uh, I'm not overly sure about that. But the just this wee bit here, where the opt twice later defeats the uh, proper separation. But anyway. It uses a Viper chip, which is a very standard chip. I think it's SGS Thompson make the Viper, and it's a 12A, very common switch mode chip used for a multitude of different um, switch mode applications. This is the main reservoir cap for that after the rectifier. Then this capacitor will almost certainly be the power supply for this chip, which is generated by a second winding on the primary. Opto isolator, the secondary goes through a single diode, charges this big capacitor, and some various bits of filtering and uh, regulation and I measured it uh, at 5 volts the supply so they've used a pretty much a USB power supply in other words really um, the output of that then goes through the control circuitry to the LED and there's one connection goes out for the through a resistor for the um, LED to indicate that it's charging and pretty much even even if you uh, I think if you disconnect I can't really try it now I'm pretty sure I disconnected the uh, battery pack and the green LED was still lit. No, maybe not, because I think there's a certain regulation that you have to indicate the battery is charging, so that probably is an indication. Uh, they probably have to make that so that the green light only lights while the uh, battery is connected. Um, the current regulation, that when it uh, when the power fails, this transistor, I think it's a, a, I think it must be a MOSFET because the voltage across it was very low. It says. Is that 8772P? I think it says that. Either B772P or 8772P. But um, either way, it had very low voltage drop across it because when you consider that the battery voltage is only about 3.6 volts and the LED voltage is probably just over 3 volts at that, uh, there's really not much of a margin. So um, the component they've used, and I found it quite easily just by pointing a thermal engine camera at it, and the component that was uh, showing the most heat uh, in running mode was this little chip here, which it turns out is a 7135, which is a very standard uh, analogue uh, 350 milliamp current regulator with very low voltage drops. That's an ideal solution for that, uh, to provide the, the 350 milliamps to the output. So, yeah, it's all in all, it's actually quite a nice little light. This was an eBay special, just a random purchase on eBay, just purely to take to bits again. But um, yeah, it's, it's actually quite nicely made. But it did have me wondering, um, if I was to design the ultimate, um, the ultimately cheap and nasty emergency light, 
um, what would I do? Now, with these ones, th there are very strict regulations regarding the current you charge the battery up at. It has to be fully recharged uh, for normal operation. It has to last three hours for a start, and it has to last... Uh, it ha once it's actually had its three hour discharge, it has to recharge within a given time. So these things tend to be uh, charged at around about 100 milliamps, which, um, you know, leaving the battery continuously trickle charging at 100 milliamps is actually going to probably, um, well, that ultimately, I guess that's why they have to change it every three years. It's traditional in, in emergency lights that the batteries get absolutely nuked uh, over a period of time. I don't know if this has current, uh, I don't know if this has charge regulation circuitry. I don't think it has, but I could be wrong. Maybe it does actually tame things down once it gets uh, to the, <coughs> once the batteries have reached a, uh, rough forward voltage about 4.5 volts. In fact, come to think of it, that's so getting so close to the 5 volt level that it probably does limit the current a wee bit once the, the NICADs are fully charged or nicometer hydrides and it floats up a bit. But I was thinking, what's the simplest possible circuit? If I was designing one just for... So let's say, let's design a Chinese grade one. So it's going to be powered direct off the mains. It's not going to use a switch mode power supply. It's going to be live and neutral, and it's going to use a capacitive dropper. And I'm pretty sure that there are some Chinese ones that do this. So let's add the luxury of a discharge resistor across that, and we'll choose 100 nano, but that could be 100 to 470 nano, depending on what sort of current you want to charge. I think I'd also include, say, a 470 ohm inrush limiting resistor. I notice that this one, just the mains go through the rectifier, bang, straight into the uh, capacitor and, you know, a lot of stuff does that, but I think that must put a lot of strain. Uh, you know, the, the capacitors must see a very high current pulse at power up, but having said that, this thing is supposed to be left powered all the time. So, through uh, the current limiting circuitry, bridge rectifier, output, capacitor, Um, and I'd use the little dark detector type circuit, that, like the solar detector circuit that detects when the power supply fails, uh, or in the case of the solar panel, when the solar panel stopped putting uh, power out, it would turn on the sort of uh, garden light. So this would go across to the cells. Uh, and it would just charge the cells directly. I think I think, actually having said that, I'd stick, uh, it's going to limit the current, so let's uh, say we stick an LED in there. And that's going to, theoretically, if the battery's in place, it's going to keep the voltage cross capacitor down to about, ooh, about uh, 4.5 plus, say, 2 or 3 for the LED, 6, 7.5, say 9 volts tops that the capacitor's going to see. Uh, so I'll be Chinese about it, and I'll rate that at about 100 megafarad at... 25 volt. Maybe even less than that, uh, maybe 20, uh, 22 megafarad because it's supposed to be cheap crap. Uh, then maybe uh, the, a standard NPN transistor with a resistor to turn it on uh, round about, say, oh, 1k. That would be about 3.5 milliamps into that. Um, and then just that links straight down there so that um, when this side is charging it, that effectively pulls the uh, gate down to ground um, and would stop that. Um, oh, now, now that actually does introduce that, it introduces another path to the LED. So the LED wouldn't actually guarantee that the, the battery was charging. Hmm, tricky. Okay, there's other ways around that. Um, and the actual LED itself, I'd just use a resistor and the LED like that, oh, squishing it all in. And that would be something like, say, a 10 ohm resistor or something like that. And goodness knows what the LED would be. Uh, use a 1 watt LED. In fact, use a 3 watt LED and then call it a 3 watt light, just like the Chinese do. And that would be nickel metal hydride, probably. Yeah, that, that would work. That would work. Now, there are other options. Um, theoretically, um, if you just took this and just bridged it right up there, so to effectively shunted that whole thing, got rid of the LED from there, you could theoretically then, in this point, you could have 
the charge LED and the discharge LED. That would be the white one. And that one would be the green one. And when the unit was charging, the current would be flowing through the green LED into the cell. But when the power failed, then that uh, resistor would just be clamped basically across the battery and th this circuitry would be in here. And then the current would flow through the white LED and that would uh, mean that the only way the green LED would light would be if current was flowing into the battery. Yes, that's interesting enough. And that would also uh, allow only two wires to be sent down to the remote light. But this would all effectively be at mains potential. But um, it would be super simple. That'd be quite handy for making a sort of home um, emergency light. Yeah, I think I'll play about with that design a wee bit.